Jeffrey Hinton. They call you the godfather of AI. Uh, yes, they do. Why do they call you that? There weren't that many people who believed that we could make neural networks work, artificial neural networks. So for a long time in AI, from the 1950s onwards, there were kind of two ideas about how to do AI. One idea was that sort of core of human intelligence was reasoning. And to do reasoning, you needed to use some form of logic. And so AI had to be based around logic. And in your head, you must have something like symbolic expressions that you manipulated with rules. And that's how intelligence worked. And things like learning or reasoning by analogy, they'd all come later once we've figured out how basic reasoning works. There was a different approach, which is to say, let's model AI on the brain, because obviously the brain makes us intelligent. So simulate a network of brain cells on a computer and try and figure out how you would learn strengths of connections between brain cells so that it learned to do complicated things, like recognize objects and images or recognize speech or even do reasoning. I pushed that approach for like 50 years. Because so few people believed in it, there weren't many good universities that had groups that did that. So if you did that, the best young students who believed in that came and worked with you. So I was very fortunate in getting a whole lot of really good students. Some of which have gone on to create and play an instrumental role in creating platforms like OpenAI. Yes, so Ilya Suskova will be a, a nice example, a whole bunch of them. Why did you believe that modeling it off the brain was a more effective approach? It wasn't just me believed it. Early on, von Neumann believed it and Turing believed it. And if either of those had lived, I think AI would have had a very different history. But they both died young. You think AI would have been here sooner? I think neural net, the neural net approach would have been accepted much sooner if either of them had lived. In this season of your life, what mission are you on? My main mission now is to warn people how dangerous AI could be. Did you know that when you became the godfather of AI? No, not really. I was quite slow to understand some of the risks. Some of the risks were always very obvious, like people would use AI to make autonomous lethal weapons. That is, things that go around deciding by themselves who to kill. Other risks, like the idea that they would one day get smarter than us and maybe would become irrelevant, I was slow to recognize that. Other people recognized it 20 years ago. I only recognized it a few years ago that that was a real risk that was might be coming quite soon. How could you not have foreseen that if, if with everything you know here about cracking the ability for these computers to learn similar to how humans learn and just you know, introducing any rate of improvement? It's a very good question. How could you not have seen that? But remember neural networks 20, 30 years ago were very primitive in what they could do. They were nowhere near as good as humans at things like vision and language and speech recognition. The idea that you have to now worry about it getting smarter than people, that seems silly then. When did that change? It changed for the general population when ChatGPT came out. It changed for me when I realized that the kinds of digital intelligences we're making have something that makes them far superior to the kind of biological intelligence we have. If I want to share information with you, so I go off and I learn something, mm. and I'd like to tell you what I learned. So I produce some sentences. This is a rather simplistic model, but roughly right. Your brain is trying to figure out, how can I change the strengths of connections between neurons so I might have put that word next? And so you'll do a lot of learning when a very surprising word comes, and not much learning when, if it's, a, when it's a very obvious word. If I say fish and chips, you don't do much learning when I say chips. But if I say fish and cucumber, you do a lot more learning. You wonder, why did I say cucumber? So that's roughly what's going on in your brain. I'm predicting what's coming next. That's how we think it's working. Nobody really knows for sure how the brain works. And nobody knows how it gets the information about whether you should increase the strength of a connection or decrease the strength of a connection. That's the crucial thing. But what we do know now from AI is that if you could get information about whether to increase or decrease the connection strength, so as to do better at whatever task you're trying to do, then we could learn incredible things because that's what we're doing now with artificial neural nets. It's just we don't know for real brains how they get that signal about whether to increase or decrease.
as we sit here today, what are the big concerns you have around safety of AI? If we were to to list the the top couple that are really front of mind and that we should be thinking about. Um, Can I have more than a couple? Go ahead. I'll write them all down and we'll go through them. Okay. First of all, I want to make a distinction between two completely different kinds of risk. There's risks that come from people misusing AI. Yeah. And that's most of the risks and all of the short-term risks. And then there's risks that come from AI getting super smart and deciding it doesn't need us. Is that a real risk? And I talk mainly about that second risk because lots of people say, is that a real risk? Mm -hmm. And yes, it is. Now, we don't know how much of a risk it is. We've never been in that situation before. We've never had to deal with things smarter than us. So really the thing about that existential threat is that we have no idea how to deal with it. We have no idea what it's going to look like. And anybody who tells you they know just what's going to happen and how to deal with it, they're talking nonsense. So we don't know how to estimate the probability probabilities it'll replace us. Um, some people say it's like less than 1%. My friend Yann Lacan, who was a postdoc with me, thinks, no, 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 we're always going to be, we build these things, we're always going to be in control. We'll build them to be obedient. And other people, like Yudkowsky, say, no, 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 these things are going to wipe us out for sure. If anybody builds it, it's going to wipe us all out. And he's confident of that. I think both of those positions are extreme. It's very hard to estimate the probabilities in between. If you had to bet on who was right out of your two friends? I simply don't know. So if I had to bet, I'd say the probabilities in between, and I don't know where to estimate it in between. I often say 10 to 20% chance they'll wipe us out. But that's just gut, based on the idea that we're, we're still making them, and we're pretty ingenious, and the hope is that if enough smart people do enough research with enough resources, we'll figure out a way to build them so they'll never want to harm us. 